Let's pray once more as we come to God's word together. Let's pray. Almighty and most high God, you are ancient of days. There is none above you or before you, and you have shown yourself to be sovereign over all things, and in your hand you hold our life and all of our ways. And so we pray and ask that you would turn our hearts once again to your word. We need to hear your voice. We need to be challenged by your truth. We need to be restored by your love, and we need to be transformed by your grace. Above all, we ask that you would turn our eyes toward Jesus, for apart from him and his perfect righteousness, we would all be weighed and found wanting. And may we together feast on the glorious truth of our Saviour when we pray in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, I grew up in the era of catchy jingles for ads. Um, my, My dad, as many of you would know, was a musician, but not a whole lot of money just writing music, so he made money writing jingles for ads. Um, And if you remember back in the day, there were often jingles written for public service announcements. I remember the first Keep Australia Beautiful campaign. I looked it up during the week. It was 1979 when the Do the Right Thing jingle first aired. Do you remember it? Do it right. Keep it out of sight. Drop it in the bin. Everybody, do the right thing. You don't remember it? It's just me. Or what about the Cancer Council with Sid the Seagull dancing around with his floppy hat? Slip, slop, slap. Slip on a shirt, slop on sunscreen, and slap on a hat. So we've had these these in various iterations since, but they they first came out in the late 70s and early 80s. These kinds of campaigns have become more serious, much darker in recent times, haven't they, with far more graphic and disturbing campaigns against things like smoking and drink driving. I'm not going to put pictures up on the board, up on the screen, just to save our stomachs. But you see, governments in particular, don't they? They think that the way to solve social problems is simply to educate people. And what this usually means is let's throw a stack of money at it, build a bureaucracy around it, committees to discuss it, advertising agencies to promote it, all under the assumption that education will bring transformation. But here's the thing, and Greg pointed this out with his uh, illustration about the wet paint. Just knowing things, being given information, given statistics, given data, even if it's packaged in a catchy jingle or a confronting image, none of this will guarantee a right response, will it? People still litter. People still get sunburnt. People still smoke and drive while drunk. It's what's called the information fallacy. If only people knew that riding a bike without a helmet is a bad idea. If only our children knew that what taking drugs would do to them. You see, the thing is, people do know, but they ignore it anyway. Now, in our passage today, we're going to see this play out in Daniel chapter 5. And this takes us back to ancient Babylon and an arrogant king who should have known much, much better. And of course, this king, Belshazzar, he would have known about what happened to his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. They may have even sung little songs about it with their own catchy jingle. If you trust in yourselves on the day of the battle, but don't look to the Lord, you might end up like cattle. (laughs) You can hear them singing it as, as they dance around the streets. But Belshazzar, he knew very well what he was doing, didn't he? But he went away with it anyway. And he was ultimately weighed and found wanting. So would you turn with me, have Daniel chapter 5 open before you. We're going to work our way through this chapter. And we'll start at the best place to start, opening verse, where we read this. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Now, straight away, if we've been working through with us the first four chapters of this book, where we've seen the mighty king of Babylon and he's the famed Nebuchadnezzar, We're quite right to ask, aren't we, who is King Belshazzar? And where did he come from all of a sudden? And interestingly, this is the same question that historians were asking for centuries. 
In fact, it was until as recently as the second half of the 19th century, there was no other historical mention or archaeological evidence for any Babylonian ruler named Belshazzar, other than this one chapter of the Bible. Now, there was plenty of attestation for a king named Nabonidus, being the last ruler of the Babylonian Empire. And so from here, big questions started being raised about the accuracy of the Bible and this, the suggestion that this King Belshazzar was nothing more than a made-up character in a fictional account. And that is until clear evidence was found in the late 1800s with the discovery of Babylonian cuneiform tablets showing not only did Belshazzar exist, he was in fact the son of Nabonidus. Once more, the literal the liberal, the liberal scholars, they're shown to be wrong. And unsurprisingly, the Bible is proved yet again to be reliable and true. So let me just map out the history. There it is for you. So we can have at least some context for what we read in this chapter. So we left off at the end of Daniel 4 with the humbled king Nebuchadnezzar. And he was restored, wasn't he, after he finally acknowledged the sovereignty and the supremacy of the one true most high God almighty. And the God of the Hebrews was now Nebuchadnezzar's God too. That's where we left it off at the end of chapter 4. But that's the last we hear of Nebuchadnezzar in the book. And this is from Dale Ralph Davies' excellent commentary on the book of Daniel. He maps out the rest of the history for us. Nebuchadnezzar died in 1562 BC after a reign of 43 years. In less than another 25 years, all was lost for Babylon. Evil Merodach. Nebuchadnezzar's son. Now you sort of think, why would you call your son evil? It's not a very... But of course, remember that they didn't speak English back in those days. Evil, evil doesn't mean the same as it does for us. So evil Merodach, Nebuchadnezzar's son, followed his father on the throne. But after a very brief reign of less than a year, he was apparently assassinated by his brother-in-law, Nereglissa, who himself had a tenure of about four years before he was succeeded by his son, um, Labashi Marduk, now, this poor king met the same end as his uncle evil. He was liquidated within a month. And one of the conspirators, Nabonidus, became king. Now, it quickly became apparent, apparent that Nabonidus was going to be a problem. He was a passionate devotee of one of the lesser Babylonian gods, to such a degree that he alarmed the Chaldean clergy. He seemed intent on prying the main god Marduk loose from his supremacy in the kingdom, so this may have led to a relocation program for Nabonidus. He spent the next 10 years um, at Tima, which is an oasis in the Arabian Desert, 500 miles south of Babylon. And his son, Belshazzar, then functioned as the de facto king in Babylon. He operated in a more pro-Mardukian manner, and so he kept the local clergy from revolt. So this is why we're suddenly staring Belshazzar in the face in Daniel chapter 5. Now, all of this historical background raises a question. If you've read through the chapter, if Belshazzar is not one of Nebuchadnezzar's children, then why are they called father and son a number of times in this passage? And the most straightforward answer is that the father-son language does not necessarily mean a literal parent-child relationship. It can simply mean the functional successor. And so we can read that the prophet Elisha can refer to Elijah as his father. They're not related as family, but they're related by role. It could also be, and this is likely, that Nabonidus married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, and this would strengthen his claim to the throne, and this would make Belshazzar a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we'll come back to this later in the passage when we get to the queen's advice, because this queen is most likely Belshazzar's mother. So did you get all of that? <laughs> I may well have you more confused than you were before. Well, at least understand this. This scene here in chapter 5 all happens some decades after chapter 4. And Daniel in this chapter is no longer the young Hebrew man from earlier in the book, but an elderly man of around 80 years old. So back to the setting. What we see here is a massive party being thrown by the regent king, Belshazzar, and he has a thousand guests in opulent luxury. But it's not the greed and the gluttony that is the main issue here, as we will soon see. Both the events of this chapter and the chronicles of Babylonian history tell us that this party was held on the very night of the fall of the empire. 
And we can date it as October the 12th, 539 BC. In fact, the Persians are camped just outside the gates of the city, having defeated Nabonidus in Timur just a few days earlier. So why hold such a massive party with the threat of war is literally just an arrow shot away? Well, it could be that Belshazzar is looking to gain the favour of the gods through this display of extravagant idol worship. Maybe, too, he is hoping to raise the morale of his people. Regardless, this is clearly something of a power move by this wannabe king. So we read from verse 2. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, just in case you missed it before. And the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines drank from them. Verse 4, as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of silver, sorry, gold and silver of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Okay, so here we see the heart of Belshazzar's problem. His arrogance, his insolence against the Lord Almighty is defiantly displayed, isn't it? As he brazenly takes the holy and sacred vessels from the temple of God. It was repeated for effect in the passage. The goblets taken from the temple of God God in Jerusalem. And he uses them for his nobles and his wives and his concubines to drunkenly drink from. As the means to then crassly worship their pagan idols. Now, what I think is happening here is Belshazzar is deliberately trying to show his own independence, his own authority over and against what he no doubt sees as weakness on the part of Nebuchadnezzar. After all, the great Nebuchadnezzar in the end so lowered himself, can you believe it, that he gave honour and worship to the God of these conquered Hebrew slave people. I'm not going to be so weak, Belshazzar is saying, I'm going to put the mighty gods of Babylon back where they belong. And look, we can use the goblets of their weak god as our own party cups. And so understand from the outset the cold and rock-hard heart of Belshazzar as he blasphemously sets himself up against the Most High God. As Sinclair Ferguson puts it, Belshazzar's heart was a factory of rebellion against the Lord. He knew exactly what these vessels were and from where they had come. He did not sin in ignorance, but with knowledge and a high hand. He sought to mock God. But as Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 makes awfully clear, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. For a man reaps what he sows. And so a clear divine response follows. Verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. Now, we cannot be certain, but I wonder if you were a faithful Israelite reading that or hearing that. And it mentioned the writing happening in the light of the lampstand. Would you not think, given that they were already using the goblets from the temple, that this lampstand would also be the one taken from the Jerusalem temple? So it could well be that God's lampstand is illuminating the writing on the wall. Regardless, this is clearly a message of judgment from the Lord, isn't it? Poor Belshazzar has a very awkward moment as he watches on in absolute terror. Picture the scene. He's there trying to make a show of pomp and power before all of his VIPs. But as Belshazzar watches this apparition of a human hand scrawling words onto the banquet room wall, we read verse 6 that his face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Now, can I just say that this translation in the NIV is trying to be discreet when it says that his legs became weak. The NASB is a little more descriptive, saying his hip joints went slack. The old King James is even more to the point, saying the joints of his loins were loosed. For those who are still not understanding the language here, 
The reality is that poor Belshazzar was so scared that he lost control of his bodily functions. Or to put it as a child would understand, he had a bit of an accident. Now, if that wasn't embarrassing enough, look at what happens next. He calls for the help of who else? Verse 7, but the enchanters, the astrologers, and the diviners. And he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now, we've seen all of this before, haven't we? We can anticipate what will happen next. Just a brief aside, notice the offer for promotion is to become the third highest ruler, which again just confirms that the accuracy of the Bible, doesn't it? Belshazzar was not the first in command, as we already covered. His father, Nabonidus, was the king, and so Belshazzar is acting king. He's the second in command. So the best he can offer is the place of the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So he calls his best religious advisors, his spiritual gurus, to help. And we read verse 8. Then all of the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. <laughs> and that's a big surprise, isn't it? I mean, really? You've called all the best wise men in Babylon? Well, all of them except for one obvious exception who's not with them. And these enchanters, astrologers and diviners can't help you? No way. We didn't see that one coming, did we? And yet, it seems to surprise Belshazzar and his guests, because in verse 9 we read that the king Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale, and his nobles were baffled. All right, so the scene is set, and we get an important transitional character introduced at this point in verse 10, where we read, The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. And you remember what I said earlier, given that all of Belshazzar's women, his wives, his concubines, were already at the feast, it would seem that this queen is, in fact, the queen mother. And this would help explain why she knows what she's about to share about an old and wise Hebrew slave who was a big help to the kingdom several decades ago. So we read from verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him, in the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of, your, that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. Now, a couple of things are worth noticing, I think, here. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that after all of these years, Daniel is still known by his Hebrew name? He was given a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, right from the start, but that name never stuck. He never became so assimilated into the Babylonian system that he was anyone else other than Daniel. And do you remember what the name Daniel means? El, or Elohim, is judge. God judges. And that is ultimately going to be the theme of this chapter, isn't it? Ironically, too, Daniel's Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, very similar, isn't it, to King Belshazzar. And both of these names effectively mean the same thing. May Bel, Bel is the name of a Babylonian god, may Bel protect the king. And what we're going to see in this chapter as it plays out, that none of the Babylonian gods has any power to save the king from the inevitable judgment of God. Now, the tone of the queen's speech, it, it really implies, doesn't it, that Belshazzar really ought to have known better. He should have known to whom he should turn when he needed divine interpretation. She effectively tells him that why did you call upon these hopeless wise men that Nebuchadnezzar, he put Daniel as chief over them? And then given the stinging and rebuking intent of her words, it's not surprising that he follows his mother's suggestion. But notice that instead of recognising Daniel in a manner fitting his role as one who was effectively Nebuchadnezzar's primary counsel, Belshazzar just puts Daniel squarely back in his place. 
Look at what he calls him, verse 13. Are you Daniel, one of the exiles that my father, the king, brought from Judah? And even though he's reasserted his authority over him, he still wants Daniel's help. So he goes on, verse 14. I have heard, I'm not saying it myself, but I've heard other people who seem to think that the spirit of God is in you and that you have insight, intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and to tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now again, I have heard, so some people say, that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. And if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, then you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now, it may be that Daniel has lived long enough, that he's been through enough royal games, that old Daniel is through playing politics. It may be that Daniel knows very well that this kingdom of Babylon is about to crumble anyway. There's no escaping, is there, that clearly Daniel has very little patience or any real respect for this stand-in King Belshazzar. There is none of the relational depth that we saw in the previous chapters between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. His response is really quite blunt, isn't it? There's no deferential greeting of, oh, king, live forever. He just comes straight back with verse 17. You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. You see, Daniel's gifts were from the Lord Almighty, weren't they? They're not for sale to the highest bidder. But nevertheless, Daniel is happy to give the interpretation because, and we use this idiom to this very day, don't we? The writing is well and truly on the wall for Belshazzar. But before he gives the interpretation, Daniel thinks it's apt and fitting to give Belshazzar something of a history lesson. And this is going to make the interpretation land with even more weight. I was going to say no pun intended, but I actually intended that pun. <laughs> I saw that on a t-shirt the other day. Words were on the shirt. Intend your puns, you coward. <laughs> So from now on, I'm going to intend my puns. Daniel's interpretation is going to land with even more weight. That's probably going to make more sense when we get to it. So this is kind of a delayed pun. Anyway, Daniel takes Belshazzar back to Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. We worked through this just last week, so this should be in our very recent memory, but Belshazzar should be well aware of this too. So reading from verse 18... Your majesty, the most high God, that is the one true God who is over and above all your puny and powerless Babylonian gods, he gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high, of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Now, what's the point of Daniel repeating all of this? I hope it's obvious. If it isn't, look at the explanation that Daniel gives in verse 22, as he says this, But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. In other words, Belshazzar, you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You knew how he was proud and arrogant against the Most High God. You knew how he was humbled. You knew that everything was taken from him. You knew that his sanity and his position was only restored when he acknowledged the absolute sovereignty of the Most High God who rules over the kings and kingdoms of the earth. You knew all of this, Belshazzar, and yet you have not learned anything. Would it not be obvious to you that it is dumb foolishness 
and vain stupidity to take on the Most High God? Verse 23, instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Do you see the awful irony? Belshazzar has been arrogantly drinking wine from these goblets with the Lord and ladies, while praising deaf and dumb idols made of metal, wood and rocks who cannot do anything for him. Belshazzar thinks that he holds the God of the slaves in his hand. And he does not see that he is the one whose very life is held in the hands of the God he is even now deriding and defying. And so if this were a courtroom, the charge has been made, the verdict has been given, it's because of your guilt, Belshazzar, verse 24, that God sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And so now comes the judgment. The interpretation of the words written upon the wall, verse 25, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Now these words are each measurements of weight. So now my pun from before makes sense. Thanks, Reuben. <laughs> they can describe currency. And so three coins used in Babylon, the minor, the shekel, and then half a shekel. But if you read these words as verbs, they read this, numbered, numbered, the repetition is given to show that it's double checked, certain, numbered, numbered, then weighed and divided. So Daniel says, verse 26, here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So clear. So definitive. There is no hint at this point that Belshazzar looked to get a second opinion on the matter. He seems resigned to what is about to happen. And I imagine that there would have been a look of disdain showing clearly upon the aged Daniel's face as verse 29. At Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And in a cold and abrupt facts-only manner, both the chapter and the mighty Babylonian kingdom ends in just one sentence, verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, so much more could have been said at this point about how the mighty walled city of Babylon was taken by a sneak attack. You can read in the Chronicles of History, the Euphrates River ran under the huge and impenetrable, thought to be impenetrable walls through the city. Apparently, the attacking army simply built a diversion upstream, ran the, the river into a, into a swamp, slowed the flow of water into the city, waited for the level to drop, walked along the muddy bank under the wall and took the city overnight. Babylon was done. But even more significantly, Belshazzar was done. And do you notice there was no... Belshazzar, if you renounce your sins and repent, then maybe God will relent for you. There was no, Belshazzar, you will be humbled for seven periods of time until God restores you. Not like we saw with Nebuchadnezzar in the last chapter. Belshazzar reminds us, doesn't he, of the parable of the rich man. This is Luke 12. Remember him? Stored up a superabundance for himself. So much so that he thought he could relax. Verse 19, eat, drink, be merry. But what happens? Verse 20, God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with 
whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This is where this chapter necessarily takes us. How many of you have been listening to this chapter? And how many of you have been thinking about the first four chapters and you're thinking to yourself, Nebuchadnezzar got so many more chances than Belshazzar got. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar did some pretty arrogant and wicked things too. He was ready to have his wise men gruesomely killed, torn limb from limb, all because they couldn't help him with a bad dream he had. Nebuchadnezzar set himself up against the Lord, didn't he, by building a statue, forcing the whole nation of Babylon to bow down and worship it under threat of death. He even threw three innocent Hebrew men into a fiery furnace. And yet God gave him chance after chance after chance. Daniel comes to him again and again to urge him to repent and turn to the Most High God. Why doesn't Belshazzar get this kind of treatment? Well, for a start, we don't know whether he got that kind of treatment in the years leading up to this account. But it seems, doesn't it, that he just throws a party and that's it for him. Does that seem fair? Well, let me take this opportunity to speak on what is a difficult truth, I think, for so many years, but is an absolutely biblical reality that we all need to accept. Hear me when I say this. The eternal and almighty and most holy God does not owe anything to anyone. Who has ever given to God that God owes them anything? Who has ever done one thing for God such that they deserve anything back from him? Or to use the language of this chapter, who among us, if we were to be weighed on God's perfect scales, would not be found wanting? Romans 9 verse 18 puts it very plainly. God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, before we question the fairness of this, Belshazzar knew the truth, didn't he? He knew the truth from the example and testimony of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. He has heard of the work of the Most High God. He's seen what happens when people turn back to him. And this knowledge would have been enough to save him if he humbly turned to the Lord in faith. And this knowledge was enough to condemn him as one who rejected the testimony, as one who rebelled against God and hardened his heart to the truth. And the reality is this. For those who continue to reject and rebel and harden their hearts toward God, sometimes the opportunity to turn and repent and be restored never comes. And for Belshazzar, his judgment day came within hours. Or maybe you're sitting here th making the mistake of thinking that you would never be so bold and brazen and disrespectful and arrogant as Belshazzar. Surely God will be more understanding of you. I mean, you may not be perfect. Who among us are? But are we really that bad? I mean, there are plenty of people far worse than you, right? Well, listen again to the Apostle Paul's words in Romans 2, reading from verse 1. You therefore have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt? For the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realising that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So do you see that Daniel chapter 5 is a gospel call to repentance? Don't put it off. Don't put it off thinking that maybe one day I'll, I'll get around to turning to God. Maybe you're, you're young here and you've grown up in a Christian home and you know the truth and you're thinking, well, yeah, one day I'll take it seriously and it'll be my faith. Maybe you're older and you've been coming along to church hearing the message week after week after week, but you know that you've yet to humble your heart before the truth. 
Maybe you're hearing it for the very first time now. Today, if you hear his voice, and I trust you are hearing his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Do it today. Do it even now. If you've been here today, then you have heard the truth about the Most High God. You know that the Most High rules over your life. You have heard the verdict that Daniel gave to Belshazzar and that God through his word is even now saying to you, he's saying, will you honour the God who holds in his hands your life and all of your ways? You've heard this proclaimed and this word is enough to save you and it is enough to condemn you. Now I had Anne read earlier from Hebrews chapter 9. These are verses which point, don't they, to the temple of the old covenant, the tabernacle. And, to the, and then from that, they move to the blood of Christ in the new covenant. In Daniel chapter 5, what Belshazzar was demeaning when he's drinking from the temple vessels, he's blind to the fact, isn't he, that the temple of God, the holy presence of God, was the only place of forgiveness and cleansing and hope to save people who are off the scales sinful. And as the book of Daniel and the judgment of Belshazzar point us ahead to Jesus, so the words at the end of Hebrews 9 are fitting. This is Hebrews 9 from verse 27. Take this, take this to heart. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. May we be counted as those who are saved by Christ, the one man who was weighed and found perfect. The call is to come to him, to have your sins taken away, and you will never be found wanting again. Let's pray. Almighty God, even as... We close now, we turn our eyes to Jesus and we long for his return. May we be those who look ahead to the glorious feast that awaits us in eternity. As those who will have their clothes washed clean by the blood of the lamb. There, there will be no place for pride, no blasphemous rebellion or vain self-glory for everyone will freely confess that they have been saved by the grace of God alone through Christ Jesus alone. And we give thanks in his name. Amen.